Hello and welcome to Frontline, your Sunday show. I am Obiora Ilo. There are several issues agitating the minds of many Africans. They range from disease, poverty, war, corruption, and many more. For instance, the recent crisis in Libya, Cote d'Ivoire, and the present crisis in Mali have made many Africans accuse our leaders of abdicating their responsibilities of peace enforcement, peace keeping, and peace resolution to Western countries like France and the United States. To answer some of the questions, we turned to an African elder statesman, a citizen of the world and former president of Ghana, John Kufo. We talked to him about the reasons for some of the developments in Africa today, considering that he was president for eight years in Ghana and participated in making peace in countries like Kenya, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and many others. Today we are starting a conversation with President Kufo that will run for two weeks. Also today, we are hosting that Nigerian hero who's brought a lot of smiles to the faces of Nigerians in the past weeks. I mean, particularly in South Africa. I'm talking about Stephen Keshe. You're watching Frontline on AIT. I am Obiora. You look glad to know that you're with us today on the program. Sit back and watch our conversation with former president of Ghana, John Kufo. I want to start our conversation yes. by uh, asking how you feel looking back all these years and those tall heights, achievements, and all that. How do you feel? I'm thankful. Thankful to uh, the Almighty. I believe in God. I believe uh, He has a hand in whatever uh, happens in my life. And uh, I consider myself so privileged to have come this far. So when I look back, all I feel is gratitude to Him. What principles? have kept you going all these years? What were those things that mattered so much to you, that guided you in your uh, pursuits in life? Uh, at bottom, it's uh, a deep-seated respect for humanity. And I always felt that uh, whatever situation I found myself in, uh, was meant for me to be of service to fellow man. And uh, that, that's the, perhaps the rock bottom. Um, fear of God, love of humanity, in whatever way. You were president of Ghana yes. for two terms. What were the high points of that service for you? Oh, all the two terms were high points, <laughs> except for one or two situations which really were out of my hands. But because I was president, I had to accept uh, responsibility for. One was uh, early in the first term of my regime, there was uh, a, a killing in the north of Ghana in the, a major tribe. Uh, of a king. Um, let's see, there wasn't anything I could do, um, and I regretted it very much that it happened during my tenure. Uh, even as we speak, 10 years after that, or 10 or 11 years after that, there hasn't been a solution or a resolution of the situation to reconcile the people of that tribe, the Dabong and I have felt so 
sad. And uh, I pray that uh, there's peace, restoration of peace and reconciliation of that tribe and also uh, of that part of Ghana. That was one. The, in fact, perhaps that's the main one. Of course, the other one was the fact that at the end of my tenure, which I consider uh, to be a major landmark in the history of Ghana, I was expecting that my party would be returned to power. Uh, somehow, given the nature of democracy, it slipped my party. And uh, so I, I just thought, again, that was a blot on the otherwise very bright achievement of my regime. But when these are the two. These are the two that were the low points. Mm -hmm. What were the very major high points? When you look the major high points are so many. Look, my government within eight years um, restored Ghana's economy uh, to the point where the GDP grew by, I think, over seven times within eight years. If you can imagine it, mm -hmm. uh, the economy of a country increasing by more than seven times. Uh, it's fantastic. I don't think it happens often anywhere. And we, the government achieved this w without um, the benefit of, say, a bonanza from oil or gas. Mm -hmm. It was sheer um, restoration of the macroeconomy and uh, with good policies that attracted uh, foreign direct investments and also um, uh, sort of drove uh, the, the private sector of Ghana. Because in fact we had come to government promising, ushering in the golden age of Ghana for business. And it happened. Um, the world acknowledged that within the period Ghana halved poverty and also halved hunger. Major achievements. And as a result, at the end, I uh, was given the World Food Prize, if you can imagine. Mm -hmm. I think 2010 or 11, in company uh, with uh, the former president of Brazil, Lula da Silva. Yes, Th these are major things. Uh, in addition, we had made all this achievement without violating the human rights of the Ghanaians. So the atmosphere was so suffused with uh, freedom and happiness. Um, education saw the introduction of free, compulsory, and universal basic education for all children of Ghana from age 4 to age, uh, I believe, 14 or so, 15, for all to, at the expense of the state. Again, the period saw the introduction, first time ever, of national insurance service for all scheme at a very affordable premium. So a man registered and he, his wife, and children under 18 got free, medical. Uh, highly subsidized medical service. It uh, never happened. Considering that my government inherited a policy that was called cash and carry, meaning if you fell ill and you didn't have money, <laughs> then perhaps you should look for the way to the cemetery. So that was it. And in every department, if you come look at the infrastructural development, roads, energy, um, you are a media person, the uh, media sector, uh, we government, first law the government repealed was uh, the, uh, what they called criminal libel law, which had been in place from colonial times to muzzle the media uh, from criticizing the authorities. We, my government repealed it. And instantly, um, there was a sprouting of newspapers and FM stations all over Ghana. As we speak, uh, in Ghana, there must be over 200 or so FM stations everywhere. 
So there's so much freedom of speech and expression. The confidence of the people. Um, uh, was spared, you know, people's confidence grew so fast that they began taking the authorities on, demanding accountability, and that sort of thing. So, you know, mm -hmm. after you left office, mm -hmm. you became a world citizen. Yes. You became I was always a world citizen. <laughs> well, well, you became more pronounced. Mm -hmm. um, some people have said mm -hmm. that democracy should not be a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. That individual societies and countries should have what some have called homegrown democracy or democracy specific for that particular area. Mm -hmm. And they are saying I... that and they're saying that because it's a one size fits all, it is a little difficult for some developing countries to adapt or adopt democracy. Well, um, perhaps we understand the word differently, but as far as I'm concerned, democracy should mean uh, the, the right of the individual to express himself or herself according as God has given him or her. So that I respect your rights as a human being. Uh, it shouldn't have color shouldn't have a, a race or um, a, a tribe or a religion. Once you are a human being, you should be entitled to think, as God has given you to, to think. You should be able to express yourself, of course, within the laws of your country, as established under um, what are described as a sensible constitution, a liberal constitution. Uh, to associate as you will, to travel as and when you find necessary, um, to uh, join a party at will, and also to resign at will. Uh, if your talent is in the direction of the private sector, you should be able to risk as you want calculated little because that's what I, I see business to me. This to me define democracy. Uh, and I, I can't see how this should be different uh, whether you are from uh, north or south or east or west. So these are the basic tenets of democracy. And I believe the uh, United Nations Declaration of Human Rights captured these and uh, for all of humanity, I believe in the universality, universality of man. Uh, and so because of this belief, I, when people say democracy should be interpreted differently according to culture or geography or whatever, I take it with a pinch of salt. Yes, I know there are some people, some nations perhaps are more endowed, they have resources, and so at, depending on where the, the, their development has reached, perhaps uh, people might be more uh, enabled to express themselves and so forth and so on. Uh, see, but at bottom, I believe these uh, values or principles should apply to all humanity. Well, as president of Ghana, mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, you've been credited with is mm -hmm. fighting corruption. I tried. Yes, and corruption is one of the biggest challenges of Africa. Mm -hmm. What would you suggest would, should be the way out? What would be your advice? Um, one I want us to revisit the definition of corruption. Corruption is uh, uh, decay. There's decay in nature, naturally. Once you are born, you grow, you, 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 you rot, you begin to get destroyed. That's the basic definition of it. Uh, corruption in politics is where uh, say, an office holder uh, 
distorts laws and uh, the opportunities of office to benefit himself or his side unduly uh, is very much in uh, places where say a society is developing and evolving uh, where society is poor when the community is poor generally uh, you, you get leaders or people in offices uh, taking advantage of their situations cutting corners so uh, whatever little resources come into the system uh, 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 much of it or more of of, of, of them are taken to benefiting and his uh, uh, side unduly. Uh, that's politics. But I'm saying it's not, uh, this is not exclusive to Africa. It's in all human societies. Corruption. Corruption. It's in all human societies. Uh, it's in Europe. It, or when you trace history, it was there at the, that stage of development where we are, you would see it in Europe, you would see it in America, uh, in Asia, everywhere. Corruption um, has been part of nature. Uh, it's so unfortunate that in Africa, uh, which has been described as the last frontier of development, uh, now we have, we, Africa is in the middle, even when you look at the globe, we are surrounded by practically all the continents, Europe to the north, America to the west, Asia to the east, and we are the last to join the, 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 the race. Because of this, uh, and given the, the, the information age, epoch in which we are in the world now, everything going on in Africa seems to be highlighted to the point where uh, the media enlarges this canker as if it's only in Africa that this distortion of what should be normal, I mean normal living uh, takes place. But I'm telling you, even with the developed parts of the world to this date, uh, or to this day, you get public office being manipulated to favor uh, authorities. Uh, it's not good because if, say, in contract, let's give, for example, in contract issue, uh, a leader uh, shows preference on basis of what he or his side is getting, very likely the contractor would uh, yes, of course, perform was it the payment upfront, for example, mm -hmm. but invariably, since the contractor is a businessman, how to make his money profit, they will put whatever they paid out on top of the contract money, which the public as a whole would then come to, to bear. So it's very difficult, but what my government tried to do against this practice, which is wrong, is, uh, was to make laws like uh, the procurement law because we, my government that is, found that uh, the most of corruption took place in the public procurement site. Where you say road making, uh, building of uh, energy plants, and that sort of thing. That's where the big monies went. And uh, uh, issuing of licenses too. So the law was passed in our regime that there shouldn't be any such uh, uh, procurements uh, without public tendering, which should be so open and public, and uh, the results of which should again be showed, so that uh, a contract goes to the best of all, the, the one that showed competence in pricing as well as in quality of the offer uh, with the necessary track record back in it. That was one. Uh, we also instituted a new office for 
um, internal audits. Uh, we saw that uh, the normal practice of internal auditors being under the uh, top management of an institution wasn't good enough. Uh, between the CEO and, say, the chief accountant and all that, if the internal auditor was tacked under the uh, chief accountant, uh, even if he audited correctly, um, the report would not see the light of day till perhaps late. So we superimposed on all the government establishments an internal audit agency that was not accountable to the immediate um, institutions and the reports which uh, would come earlier than the external auditor's report which waited till about the end of the year or so would expose any situations that uh, uh, did not conform with what was proper. And so the, the responsible authorities could deal with the situation. We instituted this internal audit uh, with authority. And then we also empowered the regular uh, uh, investigative authorities. Uh, including the judiciary, for instance. We built more co uh, court houses. We introduced the um, ICT system into the system so judges wouldn't take notes by long hand. Uh, you can imagine how tedious that was, but delayed uh, delivery of justice. Uh, we tried to improve conditions of service for people across the board. That was the first part of our conversation with former president of Ghana, John Kufo. Don't forget that the second part will be coming your way on Frontline, same time next week. After Nigeria's victory in AFCON 2013, many issues have come up, especially the future of Stephen Keshi, the man that led Nigeria to that victory. We've heard a lot of rumors, a lot of speculations. Did Stephen Keshi really resign? Was he at any point being forced to resign or threatened to resign or threatened with a sack? Well, not long ago, I sat down with Stephen Keshi. Let me start by asking you, how tired are you? Because really? you traveling. I'm <laughs> exhausted. I'm tired, really. But, you know, it comes along with whatever you see it, whatever you hear it. It's part of the game, so. Are you ever going to get a holiday? Uh, not this one. I'm not sure because in the next four weeks we'll have a game against Kenya on the 23rd of March. Uh, probably in the next 10 days, two weeks, we'll start camping with the home base players until the professionals get in here, so. Holiday, not this one, but probably after, after Kenya's game. Okay, um, tell me, um, when the whistle, you know, when the referee blew the whistle, signaling that uh, the, finals, the final match was over and uh, Nigeria had won, how did you feel at that moment? Oh, first thing was that, um, I thanked God that very second. Thank God that finally, after 19 years, uh, Nigeria is taking back its place in African um, setup when it comes to football. And again, I was really, really happy for the players because they went through so many things that, you know, so many things and that I put them through, you know. And, and of course, thanking, just wanted, at that moment, just wanted to capture what was, is it like in Nigeria, how people were reacting, because we've been hearing so many things from the beginning of the tournament, how Nigerians are not happy, 
you know, the courses and all those abuse and all. And then from, from Cote d'Ivoire game, how overnight everybody became so happy and all. The, so I wanted to see that moment, how, ah, you know, but, um, but all, all in all, I thank God and it was beautiful. Part of the feelings you had then, was it that of fulfillment? Um, yeah, yeah, the thing is I never dreamt to be a coach anyway, I never dreamt to win Africa Cup of Nations as a coach, um, but when I came into coaching, when I became the best African coach in 2005, I said, Phew. With, with Togo, I said, wow, hey. The sky is the limit. I just need to focus and readdress my desires and what I want to get in this game. And before I even took up this job in Nigeria, I was in Cotonou with a friend of mine. And I told him, I said, you know what? The next team I'm going to handle, I will win the African Cup of Nations. And we were driving and he looked at me and said, hey, amen. I believe you though. When you say it, I believe you. Because he said it he said it in Togo. And he was with me in in uh, South Africa. So after the game I called him, he came to my room and said, Do you remember when we had this discussion in Cotonou we were driving? He was driving me, he was in his car. And I'm like, mm, um, any team that I pick up next time, we're gonna win the call. Say yes, you did mention that. I was just blabbing my mouth, I mean, just saying. And it came to pass. I, I thank God for that. So. Well, they say what you want, you claim it. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Let's go back to, um, to AFCON. Of course, you took over the team when morale was so low. Nigerians hardly believed in the Super Eagles. What was your strategy when you took over the team? When I took over the team, we didn't have a team. We had a group of players. And when I came in, I, the first thing I told my president, Elijah Megari, was that I want to work with the home base players. I need to build the foundation around the home base players and pick there and there from professionals that I know are hungry and wants to commit themselves every game to, for Nigeria. And I said, go ahead. And uh, we started working out. But I know, I, I understand Nigeria that they don't, they give up all hopes, you know, that since we didn't qualify for 2012 edition, uh, it's bad, you know. I understand your feelings. I mean, I will go through that. Even as a coach in Mali or Togo, whenever Nigeria is playing, I'm looking out there, you know, I understand. But you see, um, you just have to have positive mind and keep pushing. That someday is going to be good. When I came in here, starting with uh, local home base players, the press, the media, didn't have no belief that I'm going to keep a certain amount of players in the team. They said, you know, they bring them in, and when the post comes, drive them off, and no, it doesn't work that way with me. If you're good as home base player, you can prove yourself you play. And we started building. I tried to give everybody opportunity to showcase themselves, because most of the players, I don't know them. I know them by name, but uh, attitude, their behavior level also, um, it has to play in the game. You see, we Nigerians will look at the footballistic side of the player and we're not thinking about the inward, how this player will come in and, and keep the count tight or keep the team tight. You see, you have some good players, but their behavior is terrible. They tear the team apart and there's nothing you can do. So I do not want such players. I want players that will respect one another, players that will fight for one another, 
players that will fight for the team. And that's it, you know. Um, and that was what I was looking for in every individual. And I'm still looking. What informed, you know, your decision, you know, to pick your tent with the home-based players? Is it because they, they've been neglected? Or is it because we're paying too much attention to the foreign-based foreign uh, players? What made you take, you know, this initiative, which, of course, has paid back somehow? Well, I, well I, that's what I did in Togo. That's what I did in Mali. And as a product of this, this country, I came up from, this, from the street game. Then we were playing on the street, you know, and I was given opportunity at the age of 17 to come into the... I was in the junior team with Sivan Sokpala and Harry Mosu, Frank Renawa, they pushed up to senior team, 17, 18. And, you know, because this is something in us that we can do at the senior level. And ever since then, I just I need to work with the homeless players because there's a lot of potential there, there's a lot of talent. But you need to let them express themselves and uh, try to cultivate them too the way you want, want them to play, and that was it. What were the, the, the major challenges you faced, I mean, building this team? I mean, going through the qualifications and all that. What were your major challenges? The major challenges were, you know, sometimes when you see these players in the training ground, mostly in the beginning, they're like, oh, gee. And I'm not sure I can continue with this, you know. And, and I'll just keep going and I say, you know what? Yeah, they'll make mistake. I make mistake. Oh, let's keep going, you know, let's keep pushing. Uh, challenge is that you don't get to do what you want to do anymore because you're locked in in this little apartment. You, every day with your players, there's no life. All the thing you have is football because you've committed yourself to help these kids to b develop them and upgrade their level of play versus the guys from Europe. So it's, it's diff it was difficult. It wasn't easy. You know, a lot of coaches complain of support from the football authorities, making available uh, funds making sure that you have your training, I mean, uh, your test matches, making sure you have um, training tours and all that. Did you, was that a problem while you were getting this team ready? No, no, no. In fact, I had, I must commend my federation, uh, Elijah Me uh, Mino Megari, and every friendly game that I want to play, they make sure that I get it. You know, they, even some of the friendly matches that I don't even want, they say, yeah, big boss, we have something for you. You want to say, yes, I want it. Because I just want to expose the players to play. I know I was taking risk by playing the players, you know, taking them all the way to South America against Peru uh, without no much experience. But I don't care. I just, it's them that I'm worried about for them to grow. Um, no, they've, they've given me a lot of support when it comes to friendly games and you know and of course the logistic for the players and everything has been wonderful so i don't have no complaint on that okay in afcon first match second match uh, we started remembering those words wumbling and fumbling huh. the super egos we are not super the egos we are not flying and suddenly there was an about turn what did you change what did you do? What was the magic? <laughs> what changed it for you? <laughs> you know, one thing that we did not realize in, the, in Nigeria is that most of these kids never played together until we got to Faro, Portugal. Uh, the first game we had, I mean, you can look, when we played against Catalonia, eight or seven of my home players played in that game. When we played against Kevet, maybe one or two of my local players played. The rest of them were professionals that we invited for the training camp and all those stuff. So we tried to, 
you know, try to marry each other, see which, who and who can go in and there. And although we have three other games that we, you know, try to experiment, who is this, who is that. And uh, it was, we're building gradually. The understanding started coming up gradually, but it has to take us into the tournament for us to really know how far we are. And uh, it's not that we had a terrible game against, against uh, Burkina Faso. I mean, if Burkina Faso was that bad, we would have played Burkina Faso again in the final. Mm -hmm. Burkina Faso is a good team. We played well. But Nigerians, they think Burkina Faso should be a walkover team. You understand know what I'm saying? And, and I know, I understand that the last minute we considered a goal that would have taken us to, you know, three points. And, and it's not like that. Football is not like that. You know, you, someday you have this, this day that you really want to express yourself in the game. But before you know, anxiety creeps in. You, you know, you're like, oh, shoot, what am I, what am I doing? And these boys, they came in, they wanted to do so much, but I know most of them are first time. I've gone players and all that, Good, don't worry, just play your game. Um, wasn't that we're wobbling? No, I disagree with that. It's only people that do not understand football will say we didn't play well. The second game against Zambia improved. If you, if you notice throughout the tournament, we score first. No team scored at first. So if we were that bad, we would have considered goals and start fighting our life back to, to equalize, probably to win the game. But it wasn't that way. We kept scoring first and tried to keep our shape. Until now we got and said, oh, wait a minute. This is where the Lincoln is <laughs> We're missing that link. And that was after the game against Ethiopia. I said, oh, now we've seen it. That's why we made the change we made. Brought in Mba, brought in uh, uh, Onazi, and they said, let's, let's see what's going to happen against, against Cote d'Ivoire. Or was it the threat, uh, those silent threats we heard of that spurred you on? Uh, what silent threat was that? Okay, which, so, one, which one was that? So you did the right. I was gonna. I was gonna be sad. Uh, if I'm sad, I'm sad. Jose Mourinho was sad some times ago. You Capello, had, Capello. You bother you anything. You had your eye on the ball. That is that is list of the things you know. If you is our job is higher today, fire tomorrow. If if, if I get fired today, I won't be the first or the last coach that will get fired. That's not the list. The thing that I'm worried about is, is are my players going to bring in that shape that I want in the team, the tactical discipline of the team, are they going to bring it in? If they can exhibit that, then I'm, I know I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. Let me ask you something I, I wonder each time I watch you in all those matches, especially when it's like a draw 1-1 one, one, and you don't know what's going to <laughs> it's called the next go. What happens inside you? You have butterflies or something? No. No, I just. No, how do you manage it? I. The way I manage myself to go to bed. Just sleep instead of sleep. No, but I see you chew your gum. Like, uh, yeah, you I, I chew, chew your gum. Man. I chew my gum all the time. As a player, I chew gum. I, you know, it, like, like I said earlier on with somebody, I said, you know, in this game, you don't, you can't kill yourself over a game. You know, you don't have to. In this game, there are three possibilities. You will win, lose, or draw. Life goes on, you know. And even if you win, sometimes people still criticize your play. No, talk of, <laughs> so it's, it doesn't matter how, what I feel during the game time. It's how my boys perform that I want to know. You know, Keshi, you're a young man and you've won have come. For some people, they say that's his peak. For some people, that's just the starting point. What is your future going to look like? I mean, how are you plotting it in your head? 
Are you making another prediction like you made in the most great in your head? Where are you going from here? Well, I'm still learning the trade. I'm still learning the coaching uh, game. You know, the scope of being a coach is very large. I mean, if you want to bring in all... You see, people think coaching is just have 22 men on the field, throw one ball to them and keep running, play. And that's coaching. No, it goes beyond. You have to be able to find the right drill of training that will stimulate the players. You have to be able to put every player in that state of mind of of getting getting the best quality of training from him. You need to have these players discipline and respect one another. There are a lot of the psychology comes to to play. A lot of things. Sometimes you. You've not talked about the tactical play or the positional play that is very key in the game. See, so it's not easy, it's just, I'm learning. I'm still learning, I'm hungry. I, I want to win more medals in my life. I pray to God and uh, we'll see how it goes. So, where do you want to take this team to? Um, what is your plan? My plan, I'm, I'm sure you're still building. Yes, yes. You see, um, today we're African champion doesn't mean that we've arrived. You know, um, yes, probably I have like 80% of the team that I want, but I'm still looking out there to get more players in the team that will bring tangible things to the team. I, I want to build a team that Nigerians will be very proud of, um, I want to build a team that is probably more stronger than 1994 team, but I cannot do that overnight. You need patience. Nigerians have to have patience. I don't care if they bring a Capello here, it would not do magic. If you wanted to give you a good team, it has to go step by step, you know. And, and that's where I want to take Nigeria to. I want Nigerians all over the world to be part of flying super egos and, and just have belief that yes, they have a great national team. Keshi, tell me, do you, are you happy with the way African coaches are valued, are treated? Um, that's a good question. And this is a question I've been, I've been tackling with in the AFCON in South Africa because I think we African coaches, we don't have that due respect that we're supposed to have. Um, our FAs, um, they, see, they see us as if uh, we've been favored to have this job. Um, it's like it's not on our merit that we have this job, and which is wrong. Because if you appoint me to take this job, you should give me all the liberty. You should give me all the freedom. Let me concentrate and do my job. Uh, and that's the problem with African coaches all over Africa. You know, you get a coach yesterday, you want him to perform miracle. But when the white man comes in, you say, is his first time in Africa? He doesn't know the, the, the country. Uh, let's give him two years to get himself straight, but two years is gone past. You know, um, if a white coach wants 10 balls to train, they give him 20. If an African coach wants 10 balls, they give him, what's the, Obamiki managed two or three. You know, just, you know, there's no respect for African coach, which is very wrong. And I cannot stand that. I can't stand that because these coaches, the white coaches, if they are that good, they should stay in Europe. I don't have a problem about white coaches. I have great white coaches that I've played under, and I learned a lot of them, a lot of things from them. I don't have a problem. But if you have to bring a coach, a mediocre coach, a coach that we have small season coaches in Nigeria here that is better off, something is wrong, you know. Um, that is just my stand. And, uh, 
until we have to have, believe in our own that he can do it. All we need is to support him, give him that, you know, whatever he needs, and stand behind him. About remuneration, do you think that African coaches are well paid? I mean, in comparison with the coaches in Europe and all that? No, no, coaches in Europe is a quite different ball game because in Europe, I think some of the, some of the teams or countries are very independent. They have their own budget. It's not like the country, the federal government of the country is helping out, you know, by you know bringing in money. So it's a, it's a different ball game. In Africa, you cannot do without the government when it comes to sport. You have to have the backup of government, and uh, so the payment. You as an African coach versus an European coach is even the club coach is, is more more paid than uh, a national coach in Africa. So it's a different thing. But I think we should be well paid because it's not easy. The job is not easy. It's very demanding. Except if he's a coach that does not want to improve himself, his team. Um, he just want to get stuck on one level, then that's another different thing, you know. So we are we have different categories of coaches, but you need to pick the right one that you, the FA, thinks this is our guy, this is guy that can do it for us, and they take it from there. Because a lot of Nigerians are worried if you're going to leave the team. Is that something you're considering? I was after the game. No, if I'm not after the game, after after Zambia game. After Zambia game, I there and there I said, you know, I probably need my ticket to go back because I can't take it anymore. And then my my fellow coaches said, no, 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 no. You these boys, they see you as their father. The entire team see you as their role model. You cannot do that. And I said, okay. And uh, after the training section that same day, I wrote my resignation letter. But I kept it within myself. That after my last game, Cup of Nations, I would tender it. We not lose. We not lose. And after the game against Burkina Faso, so I've been hearing people say, you know, why must you go in the air in South Africa to say that the result? That's my, that's my problem. I can say it anywhere I want. I can go to U.S. and say it. You know, that's, not my, that's not anybody's problem. It's my problem. It's me living, not, not them. But, you know, calls started coming in. And, and the issue was resolved. Wait, thank you. So, so, so you're not leaving us here? No, no. <laughs> no, we, still have, okay. we have a long, a long way to go here. So what's the message to Nigerians? I mean... Nigerians, they are wonderful people. They are, you see, I know they love this game. I know they want the best for Nigerian football. Uh, but the problem is that we do not have patience. We don't have that. If only we can have a little bit of patience and have trust or belief in their team, it will, the marriage will be more solid. Because the players now we hear, oh, yes, we're behind the team. For example, in, Ma in Mali or Togo, before we go for any game, we, if we play on Sunday, right from Thursday night, Friday, Every worker in the office is wearing a yellow t-shirt. Yellow t-shirt from Thursday. We're singing one song. There's no way we're going to go down. And we, the players, we hear that. You see these people, they come into their hotel with the yellow, the color of the national team. It's like you have goosebumps all over your body. Hey, we start the guitar and say, hey, oh boy, tomorrow. On Sunday, <laughs> not do or die you. Already, we're getting that vibe coming from. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That they're behind us. And when we go to the stadium, 
We don't care who is in front of us. When Senegal came, when we be Senegal 3 1, Togolese is not really the eyes. The same Senegal that beat France once in the World Cup, we demolished there. But the energy was coming from the people. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? And we would not see that here. Instead, we we call names, we bring the players' morale down. It's tough because most of these kids, they are not like us that grew up in Nigeria. We have this thick head after eating apple, and yam, and all these things. Our head is, our mind is, our heart. But these kids now, these days, they don't have that mind. You have to keep pushing them. Say, forget that thing as well. You know, no worry. Just you know, and it's difficult, and that is where our job is more difficult because now we have to bring in the psychologists, we have to talk to one on one, collective talk, just to psych everybody up. If only Nigerians can be patient, by God's grace, we'll give them what they have desires. Thank you, Coach Keshi. Thank you. My pleasure. Same here. That was the big boss, Stephen Keshe, talking to us about what happened in AFCON 2013 and the future of the Super Eagles. <music> Listening to someone like John Kufo reminds one that Africa has great sons. One remembers names like Kwame Nkrumah, Seda Sengo, Jomo Kenyatta, Nnamdi Azikiwe, and many more. And we keep asking, with all these men and the new generation, why is Africa still lagging behind? Are there things that Africa is not doing correctly? Are there things Africa should have done that it has not done? Is it in our stars? Or is it just that we don't want to compete and be like other continents? I think it's refreshing listening to voices like that of John Kufour. And for those that are in leadership today, maybe they should learn a lesson or two. That's our party notes and frontline for today. I am Obiora Ilo from Abuja, Nigeria. <laughs>